battery's dead. Two double A's, but don't worry about it today. Thank you anyway. Good morning. Good morning. Wonder what God has to say today. Take your Bibles and turn with us to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. If you missed last week, you missed, unknown to me, the beginning of a series, Majesty. Last week we looked at children of the king. Today we're going to look at servants of the king. And I'll use the, the actual word that's used in the Greek, and the Greek word is doulos, and I'm not going to soften the word because the word actually means slave, okay? It is a word that we're not comfortable with. Just like we're not comfortable with the word king. But in Matthew's gospel, the word kingdom is mentioned 55 times. The whole theme of the gospel of Matthew is the, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And I wish somehow that we had a better concept of king because our concept of king is tied to earthly kings, many of whom become tyrants. But there are also kings, and by the way, there are 44 kingdoms or sovereign monarchies still in our world today. And there are 52 royal families, that's a repeat of last week. But there are those kings or queens who are beloved. And the view that the citizenry have has is something called the divine right of kings. That when they were anointed king, and then their heir comes, their anointed king or queen, and so forth and so on. And they are to be not worshipped, but to be obeyed. And that brings us to today's message, Matthew 24, excuse me, 22, 1 through 14. Right now we'll just read verses 1 through 10. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like. Now Jesus tells ten parables by introducing the words, introducing them with the kingdom of heaven is like, all found in the Gospel of Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is like a king, everybody say king, king, who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. I think we already see where this is going. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. Oxen and fattened cattle, which have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention, and they went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated. And by the way, that word mistreated is far too weak a translation of the Greek word here. The Greek word here carries with it the idea of abuse and torture. And they mistreated them and killed them. Now think about this. They seized his servant, mistreated him, and killed him. Who does that sound like? The suffering servant, Jesus Christ. Understand that as servants, we are to be no more and no less than Jesus. Jesus was a servant, but now he is king. Let's go on. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. <clears throat> Excuse me, last week, 
We looked at briefly at Revelation. You may not have caught this, but there are a hundred million angels at least. How do I know that? Because the Bible calls them 10,000 times 10,000. That's a hundred million. And thousands of thousands. So I don't know exactly how many. But his army numbers at least a hundred billion strong. I guarantee you. And just think about this. An angel, an angel, one angel, <coughs> one angel has enough power to destroy the world. So imagine what 10 million could do, or 100 million could do. Anyway, so he sent his army and he destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited, notice that word invited, did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite. So new invitations are going out. These were not the ones that were invited. New invitations are going out. Go to the street corners. Another, tra another translation of this same parable calls it the highways and hedges. And invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and they gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Bottom line question is what do servants of the king do? What do servants of the king do? Matthew's gospel, for that matter, all of scripture reveals that God is our king. And His sovereignty does not require our recognition. Whether we believe or bow or don't, He is still King. Israel rejected God as King and substituted their own. You know, we have done the same thing. What do we say? We say, we are the King of our castle. We are King. In America, we have no King. Although there are some people that want to be king. There are people in government that act like king. But we have no king. And we have rejected God as our king. In 1 Samuel 8, 6 and 7 it says, But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to this. Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. King. And the rest of the Old Testament is a result of that rejection. And then they rejected him again when they rejected the Christ. They said, we have no king but Caesar. And so here we are as a church today. Here we are as people today. And we are looking to Caesar instead of to God. We look to people we look to government. We look to organizations. By the way, somebody was having a discussion with somebody earlier this morning. You know, the, the hundred most wealthy corporations on the planet are the ones running the planet now. And we look to money. And we look to the media. We look to everybody else, but we don't look to God. But let me just say, in the kingdom of God, God rules and we obey. You remember when you were in high school, maybe college, and somebody would have a poster on their locker and they'd say, seniors rule? Okay, no, you don't. For you're a senior today, but you go to the next level and you're a freshman again. <laughs> no, God rules, and that's spelled R-U-L-Z. God rules and we obey. Jesus taught us even in the Lord's Prayer, what did He teach us to pray? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are subjects and we are servants of the King. We are love bound in service to Him. The word slave is found 127 times in 119 verses. Let me share just a couple. 
about this idea of us being slaves. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6.20, you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. 1 Corinthians 7, 22-23, For he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's freedman. Similarly, he who was a free man when he was called is Christ's slave. You are bought at a price. Do not become the slaves of men. Now we could, man, we can go in so many directions with that. What does it mean to be a slave of men? But the truth is we are so much of the time. We're slaves of what others think. We're slaves of what others feel. We're slaves of what others say to us. We're slaves of money. We're slaves, you know, if you have debt, you're a slave. We just, what is it? Is the end is, is to... When is tax freedom day? You know, what, what, day of the, what day of the year is that where you work so many months or weeks at the beginning of the year and all that time, what, everything you've worked for goes to the government. And the rest that you think belongs to you belongs to the banker and the undertaker and the mechanic and whoever else you pay money to. I like to say this about people that don't believe in tithing. Well, let me just let you know that God does, okay? And if you don't tithe, he'll find a doctor who tithes, or a mechanic who tithes, or a dentist who tithes, and he'll collect your tithe through them. So I say to people, you want to keep your teeth? Tithe. You want to keep your health? Tithe. You want your car to run? Tithe. But that's not really in my message. I don't know why I threw that out there. But anyways, we're a slave to people. When really the Bible says you're either a slave of men or you are a slave of God. Let me ask you, who do you think is your better master? We belong to the king. Our lives, our bodies, all that we have belongs to the king. It says it in Psalms 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it are his. So as servants, what does our text say to us? about servants. Well, let's remember several things, and we're just going to go through this list. It's kind of one of those list messages. We just kind of have a list for you, but it comes right out of this scripture. So let's look at it. Number one, we are sent by the king. As servants of the king, we are sent by the king. Look at verse 3, and again in verse 10. He sent his servants to those who have been invited to the banquet. Now we'll talk about who those people are in a little bit, but he sent his servants. Go down to verse 9 and verse 10. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went. He says, go, so they went. Over in Isaiah chapter 6, you hear this again. In Isaiah 6, God says, well, who are we going to send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah heard himself saying, Even so, send me. The word sent is the word from which we get our word apostle. The word apostle is a sent one. Now not all of us are apostles in the classical sense. I think in the classical sense there are no longer apostles. Because there are no eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ death, burial, and resurrection. None of us are eyewitnesses. None of us are part of that original 12. So in the classical sense, no. But, later on, Paul writes that the Lord has set some of the church. Who's the first ones he mentions? Apostles. Who are the apostles? We are. All of us are sent ones in the literal sense. We are sent to go wherever He tells us to go and to say whatever He tells us to say. Hmm. Are we willing? That's the question. If you're a slave, then you must be obedient. You must be willing. Let me ask you this question. Let's, let's get down to it. We make choices every day. 
between doing what God tells us to do and what we want to do. For example, are we willing to leave our parents and our grandparents? One of the hardest things, well, I guess I was, <laughs> it really wasn't that hard back in those days because I didn't think that much about it. Looking backwards, one of the hardest things that I ever did was to leave my relatives, everything and everybody I knew back in Tennessee. Brought my wife, and what would that have been then? Uh, what? My wife and three children. We only had three at the time. We left Tennessee and we came to Kansas consequence of that was that now our five children grew up without knowing some of their grandparents, without knowing aunts and uncles and cousins and everything that I knew growing up. We were the, the only family we had was us. And then after that, the only family we had was the church. Understand something about most pastors. Most pastors, their family, in many cases, is the church because they have left. Now, I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back or any other preacher on the back. But the question is, are we willing to go? Are we willing to go where he sends us? Are you willing to go to your home state? Are you willing to go to your, excuse me, are you willing to leave your home state? Are you willing to leave your home country? Because God is king over the whole earth. He may send you across town or across the state. He may send you to someone you do not know. And think about this for just a moment. He may send you to someone you do not like. Jesus' choice for disciples were probably not people you and I would choose. His choice for disciples were cursing, hot-tempered fishermen. Not exactly seminary material. The question is, are we willing? Are we servants of the King, willing to go wherever he tells us to go. Another scripture I could share there on that same point. It was on Easter, that first Lord's Day. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. And then he added this. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Number two, are we willing to speak? Are we willing to speak? Are we willing to say whatever the Lord tells us to say? Verse three is very interesting. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet hall to ask them to come. No, that's not what it says. They didn't ask. They told. There's a, there's a huge distinction in the Greek at this point. He says, you, he says, go to those who've been invited to tell them to come. We are heralds of the king. Specifically, we are to proclaim the king's invitation to repent and believe the gospel. But what does the Bible say in verse 3? The Bible says in verse 3, they refused to come. In verse 5 it says, They paid no attention, and then they went off one to his field, another to his business. Does that not drive you crazy? You, you invite people to Jesus. You invite people to church. And what do they do? They pay no attention. They pay no attention. But you and I have to understand that you and I are servants. We're not the king. All we do is do what the king tells us to do. We tell. We tell. We invite. And we leave the results to him. Also, this parable distinguishes 
distinguishes between two groups. First, he sends them to those that were invited. Then he sends them to those who were previously uninvited. This is a, this is a, this is a uh, parabolic, or maybe that's not the best word here. It's a representation, at least, of the Jews and the Gentiles. Those who were invited, and then those who were previously uninvited. Look at verses 8 and verse 9. Then he said to his servants, he said, the banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Who is that? The Jews. What had the Jews done? They had rejected him. They refused him. Then he said to, he said, says, then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but I, those invited did not deserve to come. Verse 9, go to the street corners and invite so now he's extended the invitation to those that have previously not been invited. And invite to the banquet anyone you find. This is one of the few places in the teachings of Jesus where he foreshadows the salvation of the Gentiles. Put it in another way, me and you. You and I were not invited before. But now we've been invited. Number three, not only are we to speak but we are to suffer as servants we will suffer for the king and we see that three things there very quickly in verse three number one rejection they out and out refused to come number two indifference oh by the way that word rejection that word refusal that you found in verse three refers to a persistent Refusal. The question is, do you, do we refuse the invitation and gift of God? The idea is that he had been offered again and again and again and again until it wasn't. And let me say this to you. If this parable teaches us anything, it is that God will invite and God will invite and God will invite. God will strive with you until he doesn't. So don't you dare presume upon the grace of God that he will extend yet another invitation because that other invitation may not come. There was indifference. We found that in verse, uh, goodness, where is it? Verse 5. But they paid no attention. <laughs> they just went off and did their own thing. We're used to that. Hostility is another thing that we suffer. Well, not really. I mean, I don't know anybody here that's been uh, seized or abused or killed. But as servants of the king, somebody says, well, how far does my service for God have to go? It has to go beyond sacrifice. It has to go beyond inconvenience. My service to God, my, my service of the king of kings and lord of lords, Need, may need to go all the way to the point of my own death. That does not, by, that does not determine my service to him. That, to, that really should be irrelevant to us. You serve or you don't. We will suffer for the king. But we don't. We don't. I saw something the other day that really caused me to think. And especially in the times in which we live now. When you think about your parents and your grandparents, tough times make strong people. Easy times make weak people. And I think the same is true for the church. I think tough times make for a strong church. And easy times make for a weak church. That's what God said to Amos. He said, Woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. So we need to suffer for the king. We've got to move fast. I'm sorry. Number four. Not only do we, are we sent by the king, we speak for the king, we suffer for the king. Number four, sorry, let's start with an S. We listen to the king. You look, how, can you, how can you say, what the king once said, unless you first listen to what the king once said. Look at verse 4. I love verse 4. 
I love verse 4. It makes me hungry. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. I'm, I don't know where this prayer... I think Jesus was looking ahead in time and he said, you know what? There was a king who sent his servants to Texas. Hmm. I mean, that's a good old Texas barbecue. Just, just stay with me. Prime rib, brisket, ribs, roast. I mean, he was putting on the food bag for these folks. And he was telling me, he says, here's the menu. Here's what we're going to have. It's going to be great. Do we understand really what the king is inviting us to? The king is inviting us to be in his family, with his family, to celebrate with his family. God wants to bless people. God wants people to be filled. Man, what a message we have. But see, we don't listen. And if we do not listen, we have nothing to obey or share. There's a small point. Number five, we matter to the king. Look at verse seven. After they killed his servants, the king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. It wasn't enough just to kill them. I mean, he wiped them out. So listen, suffering servant. Vengeance belongs to God and he will reward your service. Our king is just and our vindication is in his hands. Do not test the patience and wrath of God. You don't hear anything about that anymore. People don't preach this anymore. But we need to understand that our God's people matter to Him. Even His slaves matter to Him. So much so that He takes revenge over those that do them harm. You matter. You matter to Him. Number six, we submit to His majesty. We submit to the King's authority and will. Verses eight and nine. Then he said to his servants, the, banquet, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited do not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. And then verse 10, so the servants went. Submit to the king's authority and will. I love 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, where it talks about that. In 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, it says, So then, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required, now I'm going to shift over to the King James at this point, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Or in the NIV, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Reminds me of that song, May all who come behind us find us faithful. The question for us at this moment is, will he find us faithful? Are we faithful servants? And then number seven, and I'm really looking forward to number eight because I think it's so important. But number seven, we are diligent. We as servants, we are diligent. In other words, what? You don't quit. I mean, a slave doesn't, a slave doesn't say, okay, I'm going to retire now. Ladies and gentlemen, you might retire from your occupation, your vocation, whatever it might be. God knows I sometimes wished I could. But what if that's wrapped up in your service to God? Pastor Jim Henry was the pastor of First Baptist Orlando for many years, president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and known to Donna and I. He was Donna's dad's and mom's pastor, a great man. When Jim Henry retired, he said, oh, <clears throat> I'm not retired. I'm redeploying. <laughs> Christians don't retire, they redeploy. You find a different way to serve. And I've shared with some of you here 
how I would like to do that if and when my time comes. But what you notice in verse 10, it says they gathered all the people they could find. They didn't say, oh, this is enough. We can stop now. No. It says they gathered all the people they could find. Not like today where we keep inviting the same ones over and over. Some of our best prospects, I shared this with uh, Brother Cliff earlier this morning, and keep this in mind. Some of our best prospects may start out as suspects. You're looking at this person over, oh man, they'd be great at Calvary, wouldn't they? Yes. Perfect. Beautiful family. Man, wife, daughter, son, dog, cat. I mean, great. You know, perfect family. That's who we want at Calvary. We got the guy over here sitting in front of the store begging for enough money for his next meal and we say, God bless you, be warm and be filled and we just walk right on by him. Let me just let you know that some of our best prospects may be suspects. I like what Paul says, and such were some of you. <laughs> Isn't that what Paul said? And such were some of you. How many of us were suspects before we were prospects? And then the Bible says the wedding hall was filled. It was filled. They were diligent. The servants did as they were told. They completed their mission. Our mission is not complete. And I'm looking forward to when it is. And finally, bear with me, just one last point. Servants leave the judging to the king. Servants leave the judging to the king. He said, so the servants went out in the streets, gathered all the people they could find. Notice the next phrase, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. It is not our place as servants of the king to judge who is worthy of the king. We must not discriminate. Jesus' church had former beggars, prostitutes, fortune tellers, soldiers or centurions, tax collectors, and killers. Also had rich business people and doctors. We want the rich business people. We want the doctors. But do we really want the killers? Do we want the prostitutes and the beggars? I like the bumper sticker. Love everybody. Let God sort them out. And Marilyn Manson had a nasty version of that. She said, kill them all. Let God sort them out. But I like the Christian version of that. Love everybody. Let God sort them out. <coughs> Augustine. St. Augustine said, God loves each of us as if there were only one of us. So we must not discriminate. We must not be evil judges. James 2 talks about that. James 2, 1 through 8. Bear with me. I'll read it quickly. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom He promised those who love Him? But you have insulted the poor. It is not the rich who are, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of Him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law, listen to that, royal law, the law of the king, if you really keep the law of the king, love your neighbors as yourself. You are doing right. But here's the truth. We invite, we tell, we go, but all do not respond to God's grace. 
Even today, there are wedding crashers. Those who seek entry into the kingdom without the proper garments of faith and salvation and the righteousness of Christ. It is not our place to judge. It is our place to be faithful. But it is His place and His privilege as King to judge. Look at verse 14 where it says very simply, well, let's read verses 11 through 14. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. In other words, he wasn't ready. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. And by the way, without Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, you too will be speechless when you stand before the king. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. We are not responsible for the way people reply, uh, respond. Many are called, but few are chosen. Why? Because of self-will and stubbornness, rejection and unbelief, a failure sub to submit to the norms of the kingdom. Those who remain are called the electoi in the Greek, the elect in English, the chosen. God's sovereign grace, the grace of the king, is always in control. So remember, as slaves and servants of the king, we, not, we nonetheless serve a king who is gracious and loving, in control, sovereign, king of kings, and Lord of Lords. Are you a servant of the King? Someday we hope to hear His words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And all God's people say, Let's stand. OCD take over back right there. <laughs> I'm not feeling the greatest this morning. I'm just a little short of breath, but don't let that distract you. Would you just respond to the invitation?